Welcome to this Best of Mount Shasta event. And um, when I was asked to participate in this event, I was guided to give you a talk about the seven qualities that you need to embrace in order to find your own wholeness and oneness with yourself. Because we're moving toward a very powerful time on the earth of becoming one with all that is. But before you can become one with all that is, you have to first become one with all of yourself. And that literally means that you have to learn to love every single inner voice, even the ones that seem negative and limited. You don't need to argue with them. You just need to learn to give them your love because love is the most powerful energy for transmutation. And when you learn to love all those parts of yourself and when you learn to love all those parts of other people, you can live in a state where you're, where you no longer have to worry about things like boundaries, where you no longer have to um, feel overly responsible for other people. Because when you come to that place of learning to love every part of yourself and every part of everyone else, you also begin to understand that everyone is in a constant state of growth and evolution. And even if they seem to be in a very negative and non-spiritual place in their life, we need to learn that they're doing exactly what they need to do in order to learn and grow, not judge them for it while still using our discernment about what we want to interact with. So this is kind of at the roots of what I'm going to be talking to you about here tonight. And I'm hoping we'll have time for a little meditation also. But before we get started, I'd like to just do an anchoring of space. So let's close our eyes for a moment. So I'm calling in the white flame of divine truth and the rainbow flames to just come in and purify this energy in this room. And we ask for a clearing of all of the people's energy who have been here who are not here now to be removed their move their energies from this room. And I'd like to welcome the guardians of the crystalline cities of light of Mount Shasta. And we ask you beautiful ones to anchor around and through this space, the crystalline pillars of light and the sacred geometry of the Dolphin Star Temple for healing, releasing evolution, awakening to divine truth and mastery. And we ask that this temple is anchored for the duration of this time that I'm speaking and connecting with the people here. I'd like to welcome the Dolphin Star Temple Higher Council of Light, the Pleiadian, Syrian, and Andromedan Emissaries of Light to join us and to anchor above and below this space and above and below each person in this room, the inner dimensional cone of light for alignment with divine truth, the evolutionary cone of light for alignment with divine purpose, the intergalactic cone of light for alignment with the great central sun and the divine source of all that is, and below our bodies and auras and the, below the temple, the earth cone of light for alignment with the ascension plan for the earth and her people. I'd like to also welcome the ascended masters and archangels who dwell in Mount Shasta. Please be with us and hold us in your love. And Archangel Michael and Saint Germain, please seal this space with your sword of truth and your violet flame. Holy Mother and Holy Father of all that is, please hold us in your love, in your vision of who we are, 
and in your beautiful male-female balance, equality, harmony, and oneness. And so be it. So I was taught by the guides quite a few years ago about this process that we need to go through in learning to embrace certain divine qualities in order to become one with ourselves and all that is again. And the first of these seven divine qualities that I'd like to talk about is, is an obvious one, the quality of unconditional love. When you can have self-acceptance and unconditional love for yourself, there are no more problems in this world for you. Because when you can fully do that, you have come home. Because you see, any sense of loneliness or loss or shame or any of those things is just an absence of self-love. And when you can learn to love every part of yourself unconditionally, it will just naturally overflow out to others. Because I'll tell you a secret. You cannot be in an unloving space toward other people and still hold self-love at the same time. And you cannot fully love other people until you have self-love. Because there will always be some part of you holding back or feeling undeserving or like you're not worthy. So the very first thing you have to do with unconditional love is learn to love yourself. And that means every past life that you have ever had, even when past lives that you were doing things that you might think of as terrible, you have to learn to love those parts of yourself and recognize that the parts of you that did those things needed to do them in order to learn and grow so that when you finally choose to be fully of the light and love, you will have gone through all the experiences of all, all the sides around it. So when you make that choice, you know you're making it from a no place of knowing and experience and inner wisdom. So whether you had a past life as a black witch or a wizard, whether you had a past life where you killed someone, where you used people financially or in any other way, when you remember those past lives, there may be healing to do. But the main thing to do is learn to love those aspects of you and recognize them as part of your learning here on the earth and parts of your learning that maybe you don't want to repeat those things again. But learning to love those parts of yourself from the depths of your being. And like I mentioned earlier, learning to love every inner voice, even the ones that are saying negative things about you or about other people. It's not about arguing with the ego. It's about loving it into the light. If you can love those inner voices enough, you'll start to know that the notice that the inner voices that maybe you've heard for years, they start coming less and less often until finally they don't come anymore. Because if you can just love them, they start to dissolve a little at a time. We also have to learn to unconditionally love everything about other people. Even if it's someone who's creating war on the earth. If you can love that person, you can give them the most that's possible for them to receive. And even if they aren't consciously aware of your love, it will still be there, waiting for their first opening of willingness to let the love in, and it can start transmuting parts of their psyche. You can do this for people all over the world even with just a moment of holding them in unconditional love. And of course there's a forgiveness that happens automatically when you can do that. If you can truly unconditionally love anyone, the forgiveness is automatic. Because you can't hold unconditional love and still hold blame at the same time. They just don't coexist. 
because the unconditional love transmutes the blame. The second of the seven divine qualities that you have to hold in order to come into oneness is learning to live in a state of divine trust. Now, we've all seen things in the world that make us know that there are people who have not become trustworthy based on their day-to-day experiences. But what we must embrace is a divine trust from a place of knowing that everyone in existence is going through a cycle of 360 degrees with every issue. And maybe you're at 320 around issues of honesty. Maybe you're around 280 around issues of speaking your truth. And maybe there's someone around here that's only up to 20 or 30 or 40 But what you need to realize is that spirit looks at everything in existence from a place of no time and space. So from a higher dimensional spiritual perspective, we are all going through all 360 degrees at all times, which means you're no different from that person who's at 20 or 30 from a higher perspective. You see? And everyone will eventually learn. It's pretty much impossible to exist and not learn from your experiences. Even if you resist the learning for a long time, you're learning even through the resistance. (laughs) It's kind of comical in a way, because even people who don't appear to be learning and growing, even people who appear not to be their very good people, quote unquote, they still have a purpose. So what you need to embrace is a divine trust that everything in is, is in order. In divine trust, you see that everyone is learning and growing. You can still recognize that they may not have come to a place where they have earned your trust on a daily life basis. But you can have divine trust in the simple fact that they are learning and growing and that they are fulfilling a divine plan of their own in everything that they do. And we're responsible for using our discernment to choose what we interact with. Because it doesn't mean you need to marry or make a best friend of someone who's lying or stealing or physically harming others. But if you have a divine trust that that person is learning and growing and will eventually come to that place of full awakening and enlightenment just like you will, then you can learn to look at them in a new way where you don't hold them as, oh, that terrible person. Because the moment you have a judgment about someone like that, you contribute to the negativity. It's almost like you're declaring a war. So in that transcendence of judgment, we learn to trust people on that higher level while using discernment about where they're at in their day-to-day life in the moment without judgment. Does that make sense? Yeah. But I'm going to look at my paper occasionally just to see what the next issue is. So the next of the, of the seven qualities that I want to speak about is surrender to divine will. Now, some people have this attitude of like, God, I give it over to you. I don't know what to do. <laughs> but people, we are each a little part of God, goddess, all that is. Each of us has a higher self, a Holy Spirit. So when it comes to surrendering to divine will, It's really your own inner divine will that you're surrendering to. And sometimes that divine will is aligned with all that is, with Holy Mother, Holy Father, all that is, with the guides. But it's your own inner knowing of what is right that you surrender to. In surrendering to divine will, you're also making an agreement with yourself to live in impeccability. And impeccability is related to the part of you inside that always knows what's right or wrong. If you really take a moment to get quiet and go inside and you ask yourself, 
What is the right thing to do right now? There is a part of you that always knows. And listening to that inner part that knows what is right has to do with learning to live in impeccability. Impeccability is the way of the spiritual warrior. And the spiritual warrior is not in battle. The spiritual warrior is standing up for right. So when you make a choice to surrender to divine will and live in impeccability, you're surrendering to your own deep inner knowing. Because when the ego is out of the way, we all have inner knowing. And when you're learning to meditate and get quiet inside, the moment you can find that quiet and that stillness inside, you can find your inner knowing. And if the inner knowing is telling you, I don't know what the right next step is, then you can just accept that for the moment and continue with what feels right along the way until you get a strong message about something. But learning to listen to your own inner knowing, learning to make a deep connection with your higher self, and let that be the voice inside your heart and soul. That's what real surrender to divine will is. And isn't it kind of beautiful to know that? You see, we're not meant to have, quote unquote, an ultimate teacher outside of ourselves. Even those who have a guru, it's not meant to be a long-term relationship. And if a guru is trying to make it a long-term relationship, you should be walking in the other direction. I always tell my students when they come to my trainings, you're going to learn a lot during these trainings, but if everything doesn't eventually become obsolete, it hasn't worked. And me as your teacher will come to a completion when you have to take over on your own for yourself. And even as you're learning from me, you need to use your discernment for what works for you, what doesn't. And the classes will stop. They won't go on forever. And from that point, you'll have the tools you need to bring yourself into your awakening if you're ready, if you can trust and love yourself, and if you're surrendered to divine will. So there those three things are again. Some people think they have to give power over to someone outside themselves in order to learn and grow. There may be times along the way when you need a teacher for a certain period of time. It's never meant to be indefinitely. No one is good enough beyond you to ever be your teacher indefinitely. And that's a very important thing for you to recognize because that can help you start moving into your own sovereignty at a deeper level. And in that sovereignty is a continual step during life of surrendering to divine will in every single thing that you do. If you know that you're supposed to talk to someone about something but you're scared to do it, the part of you that surrendered to divine will takes a deep breath and does it anyway. You no longer give your power over to that fear or that resistance or that consider concern about whether there's going to be anger or confrontation. You just speak your truth in a clear, direct way. If you know that the right thing for you to do is to go up to a perfect stranger and ask them if you can hug them and tell them I love you, then you do it. If you know the right thing for you is to stay home alone today, then you stay home alone. If you know it's right for you to go out in a public place, you do that. Whatever is the right step, each step along the way, you feel the rightness in your heart. And you never do something because others think it's the right thing for you or because maybe I'll miss out. If you think you're missing out on something, that's your ego talking. Your inner self knows what's right and what's needed. And your inner self can direct you to the divine will for you to surrender to if you're ready to do that. One step at a time. The fourth quality we're going to talk about 
is living in desire for divine truth. And before I start talking about that, I want to tell you a little story of someone I knew many years ago. There was a man who was from California and did regression therapy for people. And he had moved to Irvine, Kentucky, where I was living at the time. And he told me that he decided he was going to go around to every church in Irvine, Kentucky and ask every minister if they were ready to know the total truth. (laughs) Guess what he heard as an answer. (laughs) He said only one of the ministers out of probably 20 churches said yes. The rest of him called him a follower of Satan. We're not meant to know truth. God knows truth, you know. Or... They just, they wouldn't believe that there was a potential for really aligning with divine truth. They didn't want to hear anything he had to say once he asked that question. Some of them yelled at him afterward. And what does that tell us? That deep underneath it all, they were terrified of the idea of knowing truth. Because they were afraid that the truth might contradict their lifestyle, their ego identity, and who they are. So they weren't willing to know divine truth. But the person who has really and truly stepped onto the spiritual path, the number one thing that you need to do in stepping on that spiritual path is surrender to the desire for the divine truth and the expectancy of finding it. We talk about truth in terms of Well, I know she said this. I heard her. Or, I know that that's the truth about it because I saw it happen. Those are relative truths. Our day-to-day experiences, the things we hear, the things we see, the things we do, those are all based on what I call relative truth that is constantly changing as we live in time and space. And as time moves one step at a time, the truth that was five minutes ago is no longer the truth of now. And it was never a total truth. It was just a passing truth based on experience. Divine truth has to do with things that are eternally real. For instance, eternal love is a divine truth. Because existence will never be without divine love. Existence is always based on a oneness. Even if people's consciousness is not actively part of that oneness in the moment, they are always a part of that oneness. That's a divine truth. But to have a desire for divine truth means that you're not willing to settle for anything less than a truth that can last forever. A truth that is eternal. It's not about saying, well, I'm right and she's wrong and that's the truth. That has nothing to do with truth. That has to do with ego reality and relative truth. Divine truth is an eternal concept. And when you reach the place deep in your heart that that desire for divine truth is the strongest desire inside of you, then you're really going to move forward on the path in a very quick and beautiful way. Because once you won't settle for anything less than divine truth, you are moving toward your mastery. And the self-mastery is the first thing that you will conquer. So the desire for the divine truth and the expectancy to find it is the fourth principle we're talking about today in terms of finding oneness with yourself and eventually with all that is. But I want to ask you a quick question and then I'm going to continue with the seven things. Have you started to notice that each step in this process is also linked with the others. 
For instance, it's impossible to have a desire for divine truth unless you have some unconditional love in you, unless you've learned to trust the divine plan of existence, unless you have surrendered to your own divine will, it would be impossible to truly be on a path of finding truth. So each of these are interlinked, as are the other three that I'm going to share with you today. The fifth, the fifth principle that you need to embrace fully in order to find oneness with yourself and others is the principle of loving acceptance. And it's one of my favorites. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, I read a book called 2150 A.D. by Thea Alexander. And it was a book written in a story form. But it was a book written about this man learning about loving acceptance. And he had to learn it through going through some what normally would be thought of as terrible things. He had to learn it through witnessing people being quote-unquote harmed. But in each situation, he had to come back to a state of loving acceptance. And what loving acceptance is is it means that you not only accept things exactly the way they are as being perfect, but you love that things are exactly the way they are, and that's what's perfect. Now, this even applies to traumas that you've gone through. For instance, when I was six weeks old, my father started sexually molesting me. I went through a lot of pain and trauma in the process of healing that. But I have gone way past that. Now when I think about it, I can only feel the loving acceptance, the compassion for him, and the forgiveness. Because I, what I've experienced through that was that in my agreeing to do that with him, I gave him an opportunity to see that he needed to get help and find a psychiatrist or a counselor to help him. He didn't make that choice, but it was a choice he gave himself in this lifetime, and I agreed to be part of it. But even more than that, through the traumas I've had to heal with my father, who also actually killed me when I was a year old and I died and came back, I have learned how to be a really good teacher with helping other people heal deep emotions that maybe they're terrified to feel the what happened or to remember. But because I know how to get through it to the other side, I know how to help them get through it once they're willing. And I need, I know how to take them all the way through the total transformation of it because I'm now at a place of loving acceptance with those things. I've been raped in this life. I had a husband who was physically violent with me. I've really gone through it, believe me. I mean, I could name a list that goes on and on. But there's none of those things that I can talk about that I still feel any negative emotion about because I've purged those old emotions from my body. I've learned to love and have compassion for the other people and for myself. And I've learned to have loving acceptance, which means I don't only accept it because I have to, but I can love that it was exactly the way it is because of what it taught me and what it taught the other people involved. Loving acceptance is a beautiful state of consciousness. And it is very different from unconditional love. It's, it's related. Can you see what I mean by the difference? So in your healing process, you have to come to a place with every single thing that has ever happened in your past lives, everything that's ever happened in this life, with anyone, any place, you have to come to a place of not only accepting it because you have to, but loving it, loving that it was exactly the way it is in your acceptance because of knowing that everything that has ever happened to you is moving you toward being the most powerful divine master that you could ever possibly be. And when you have fully let go of all those identities of victimhood or as the victimizer 
when you've released all those identities of separation and being too different from other people, of having to hide everything from others, when all of those things are gone, each and every one of them will have made you stronger and wiser and more beautiful and more able to share with others. And it's not saying you have to become a teacher or a healer. Just by going through the healing, it's as if you're here and you go through a transcendence of some past issue and you move here. Well, what that does is open the space where you were for someone else to step in and go through the healing. Because even if they live in Timbuktu or China, you have gone through it and left an example for someone else who's ready to follow. And that's the way the healing process of the planet as a whole goes. Whether you ever speak to anyone about it, whether you ever do anything other than heal it and change your inner workings, you have left the space for someone else to follow in your steps. So good for you. <laughs> That's how mass consciousness changes. And there is a point where a certain number of people will have healed on many levels that it will, the wave of that a reality will go through everyone, but it won't affect them if they're not willing. Because the one thing that's necessary for grace to happen is willingness. If you don't have willingness, you could call on grace from now till, till evermore and never receive it. Because that willingness has to be there before grace can come in. And also you have to have mercy on yourself before grace can come in. But I'm getting off the track. <laughs> the next issue, number six, is living in unity and diversity. And this is a really beautiful one to me too. And do you know that there was a divine plan set for this planet before it was ever inhabited, that we would eventually come to a place of unity and diversity? That was the first divine plan for this earth, is that we will find unity and diversity here. And what unity and diversity means is that even though this person may be a Christian, this one may be Jewish, this one may be Muslim, that you can see them all as equals. You don't think of you and your spiritual practice as being superior to anyone. You don't see yourself as being inferior to anyone. You learn to feel a sense of unity in diversity, meaning that no matter how diverse people are in their way of life, you can you still know that there is a unity between all of you even if your opinions and the way you live your life is totally different that there is still a oneness and you honor that oneness by honoring and respecting everyone no matter what their path is now i have to admit even in this so-called new age world there are many paths that kind of like to teach, well, I know that they're okay, but we're far superior, you know? People who like to think that whatever they're doing, whatever they're teaching is the best, and until people realize that, they won't move as far as we are, but we can still still have compassion for them. That's just pure ego arrogance, people. If you ever go to any spiritual teacher who talks anywhere remotely like that, just say, goodbye, it was nice to meet you. <laughs> because we all are equal. But there are many different types of people on this earth, and there are many people on this earth who are at different levels of their own spiritual growth. So, for example, t example talking about religion and spirituality, there's a place where some people are in their growth where they need to be part of the Christianity that absolutely tells them what's yes and what's no and what to believe in because at their, person at their stage of personal growth right now, that's the only thing that can reach them. There are people right now who are Muslim or what is the, I keep thinking, trying to think of the name of the group that's out in uh, Utah. Mormons, yes. There, there are Mormons, <laughs> there are Jews, 
I came from a very, very Bible Belt country. I grew up in the Christian church. My mother ended up marrying a primitive Baptist, which are about the most orthodox you can ever find. And I have heard my my stepfather many times stand up on the pulpit and saying, we're the only ones who are aligned with God's truth. And all of those other churches are are damned. <laughs> I've literally heard him say that. The primitive Baptists are the only ones. That's scary. It's really scary. But the thing is, somewhere along the path, there must be a place where people need that kind of religion in order to go to their next step. (laughs) And when we can learn to look at each person, the person who dresses in, in an unusual way, the person who is is a hippie, the person who is very formal. It doesn't matter how people dress. It doesn't matter how they talk. It doesn't matter how they raise their children. There are so many people that have so many opinions about what is the way it's supposed to be and how so many people are right and wrong and blah, blah, blah. And they go on and on and on spouting the lack of virtue in this world. But they don't realize that right at that moment they're the one who's lacking a certain virtue because of their condemnation and judgment of others. They are more stuck in negative ego than many people who are part of the Christian church or the Mormons or whatever, or even those who consider themselves atheists. Did you know that when I was in my 20s, I went through a time of thinking of myself as atheist? Because I had been so ingrained with the Christian church teachings. And I, had, when I was 18 years old, I got involved with a black man My mother had always taught me not to be prejudiced, that to say nigger was an offense, that never she never wanted to hear it or she'd spank me, blah, blah, blah. So when I just naturally fell in love with the black guy in college, my mother came storming in, commanding that I get out of this den of iniquity and away from these niggers. And all these things she had told me I could never say, how suddenly she was saying it. And I'm like, but mom, you told me that we were all created equal by God. And she says, I didn't know you were going to go out and start dating one of them. (laughs) Bless her hypocritical heart, you know. And she was the first one to spout out about people's hypocrisy. But she couldn't see it in herself. You know, I, I, when I started learning about astrology years ago, I started looking up some aspects of my mother's. And one of the things in her chart that stood out so much to me was the aspect that said, this person doesn't believe they have opinions. They believe they're right, and anyone who doesn't agree is wrong. <laughs> that was pretty much a perfect description of my mother. So learning to live in universe, unity and university, <laughs> learning to live in a university, <laughs> learning to live in unity and diversity is really learning to honor every choice that anyone makes. Again, whether it's education, way of dressing, way of speaking, religion, anything and everything that they do, that you can honor them you can, and you can honor their free will because in unity and diversity, the most important thing is that you learn to honor everyone's free will. And you don't think that you know better than them. You know that they're doing exactly what they need to do and what's right for them, and it doesn't matter whether it's right for you or not. And that can help you feel that unity, that oneness. That's how we're going to finally come to a one-world government that's not controlling is by learning to live in unity and diversity. No more wars that have to do with religion. No more wars that have to do with territorial boundaries. Because the truth is, we can't own this earth. Even if you quote-unquote own a piece of property, you're literally just a guardian of that property until your time here is done. The property will outlive you, and it was before you. So we're really meant to be stewards on this earth. And we're meant to live in that respect and honor for everyone in unity and diversity at all times. Now, the final quality I want to talk about 
Yeah. Has to do with seeing the best in everything. What I've learned through my years on the spiritual path is when you hear the news and you go into spouting, oh my God, what a tragedy, what a horrible thing to happen to those people, you actually contribute to the trauma and you contribute to the negative creation. Even if it's a war that's happening, like what we're doing over in in the Middle East now, if you respond to it with things like, what the hell is this government doing? They're so stupid, blah, 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 blah. You're creating war on them with your thoughts. And that's as just as much war as the war that they're fighting. They may be killing people, but you're creating separation and ego division. We have to learn that every single thing that we experience or hear about, that our, po- our purpose in that situation is to send loving, honoring energy and trusting that in the long run it will lead to something where the divine will happen. And we have to look at it as What is the best thing that could come from this? I want to just give you a little example of one that happened to me many years ago. Do you remember when there was that gigantic earthquake in Japan and over 5,000 people were killed? The day before that happened, one of the Syrian archangels came to me and he says, I want you to come with me so I can show you something. So I went with this Syrian archangel up to a light ship that he had. And he showed me a focus that was being held on that part of Japan at that time. And he says, there's going to be a really huge earthquake. And a lot of people have volunteered to die in that earthquake because the people of Japan have become so robotic. The purpose of this earthquake is to shake them up and get them to start looking at their priorities and helping them start to recognize that they have to learn to be more loving with each other. They have to learn to help each other more. They have to learn to get more real because when this earthquake happens, it's going to create some extreme traumas for people who have lost their relatives You know, a lot of women with children who've lost husbands who supported them. A lot of families where everybody's obliterated except for one. Where the whole neighborhood is destroyed. And if people can come through this from a place of recognizing that they need to be more loving with one another, that they need to not take things for granted so much, that they need to learn to work together more and start stepping out of that robot mentality where everything in their life is automatic and the same, then it will have done a great thing. So the next day in the news, I heard about this earthquake and I just sent a lot of love and compassion and good wishes to the people there. I didn't see it as a tragedy. So we have to start seeing that we are meant to have a lot of love and compassion for people. But even when things like Haiti or the big earthquake in in Chile happen, we have to recognize that the earth is trying to cleanse her body and take back her own awakening. And we have to recognize that there's always some teaching that's being given to the people involved and the people around them that is going to come from this experience. Do you get what I'm saying? So it means that even if your best friend or your husband or wife is suddenly killed in an accident, it's natural to go through a grieving because that bonding you had with them in their physical body is gone and you can feel the loss of it. But you need to not see it as a terrible thing. I mean, people go around being the victim in those situations for a long time, you know. 
Well, this car came out. It was a drunk driver and hit and killed that person. What a horrible thing. He didn't deserve that. How do you know? How do you know that it wasn't that person's time to go? How do you know that they didn't volunteer to die at the hands of that drunk driver so the drunk driver could start to awaken? It could be something that simple. Because these bodies are not who we are. They're just a spacesuit that we wear for a while for living in this earth. And so we have to learn to look at everything that happens and try to bring a positive focus to it. Even when 9-11 happened, if you could go back to that time frame and hear about that happening, I'm sure there would still be some initial shock with it. But my God, look at the way it changed the people of New York. I mean, it did a huge changing of the people of New York. It also brought it brought things that were killing a lot of people to the awareness so that they could be handled. It doesn't mean that it was an overall quote-unquote thing to celebrate, but there are things in it to celebrate. And when something like that happens, if you can start to train yourself to not go into the tragedy, the judgment, the negativity, the victimhood, and you can just start sending your love and your compassion, your wish for truth to be revealed to people, your alignment with that unity and diversity, and you can bring as much positive energy toward that as is possible, then you can contribute to the awakening of the people on earth instead of the hiding in the shadows and staying in the negative ego identity and the victimhood. So learning to look at every situation that happens in a positive way and looking for the best in it. And if you're not sure what the best in it might be, then just call on the angels of grace to assist you in bringing grace and compassion and whatever's needed to those people. If one of us does it, it has a certain impact. If two of us do it, it has ten times the impact. If ten of us do it, it has a thousand times the impact. (laughs) Isn't it amazing the power that we have to start changing the world simply by learning to monitor our thoughts and our emotions, choose what we believe in as truth, and let go of the things that are not truth. So those are the seven divine qualities I was taught that we have to learn in order to come into oneness with ourselves. We only have about nine or ten minutes left. I just want to make a short meditation with you to connect with your higher self. So let's close our eyes. And just take a few deep breaths and bring yourself into your body as much as you can. And breathe and feel your feet on the floor and your buttocks in the chair. And ask the guides who are here with us to help you adjust your aura, because some of you are way out there. So just bring your aura in so it's only two or three feet around you in every direction as a way of concentrating your energy. Now, we all have what I call a tube of light or a divine axis connection. And this tube of light connection starts at the center of the top of your aura, about two feet above your head. And it's like a tube that comes into your crown, around your pineal gland, around your whole spine, and all the way down to the center of the bottom of your aura. I call it, again, the tube of light. So I want you to call on your own higher self of the light, the Holy Spirit that you are, and ask your higher self to start filling that tube of light with your higher self's Holy Spirit energy. 
and start breathing into your crown and letting that energy from the higher self begin to fill the tube of light coming into your crown moving all the way down around your spine and keep breathing it in deeper and deeper until it's all the way down to the bottom of the center of your aura. And as you're breathing and filling your tube of light, just letting yourself affirm I am a beautiful God or Goddess embodied. I am ready to remember who I am. Just asking for that tube of light to fill up to maximum capacity. And take a deep breath and let the tube of light, higher self energy overflow and fill your crown chakra. And take a deep breath into your third eye and ask for the tube of light, higher self energy to overflow and fill up the front and back of your third eye. And now asking for the higher self energy to overflow the front and back of your throat chakra. Breathe deeply and help the overflowing with higher self energy. Breathing deeply into your heart chakra, asking for the higher self energy to overflow and fill up the front and back of your heart chakra as much as possible. Breathing deeply and opening your third chakra as much as you can. Asking for the higher self energy to overflow the front and back of your third chakra. Breathing deeply into your second chakra. Asking for the higher self energy to overflow the tube of light front and back. And finally, breathing deeply and opening your root chakra as much as you can, letting the root chakra overflow with higher self energy. And just sit there in your center and feel this beautiful energy overflowing your body, your chakras, and know that that beautiful energy is who you are. I am you, you are I am, we are one, and in that oneness, all that ever has been, and all that ever shall be, is here now is here now. I am that, I am that I am. I am that, I am that I am. I am that, I am that I am. 
am. I am that. I am that I am. Let's just take a moment to give thanks to our higher selves and to all the guides of light who are here with us today. Giving thanks that divine truth and pure unconditional love and loving acceptance, that unity and diversity, divine trust, seeing the best in everything and desiring and expecting truth that all of these qualities were within our reach and we ask our higher self and the guides to assist us in moving deeper and deeper into these qualities and into learning to love every part of ourselves unconditionally at all times so be it, so be it, and so be it and so it is you can open your eyes and come back to the room. I think my time is done. I just want to make a quick announcement. Um, I do um, a spiritual gathering every month on the first Sunday, which is today. And it starts at 7 o'clock. And it's at my new store, which is at 105 East Alma Street. If you know where Papa Murphy's is, if you just go around the corner, I'm right behind Papa Murphy's. And that's where we hold the spiritual meditation channeling. Often it's things that are coming through that have to do with the next step for planetary awakening. And sometimes not. <laughs> and that's tonight at 7 o'clock. If any of you wish to come, it's either free or by donation, and that's your choice. And thank you for letting me speak with you here today. Namaste. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.